While we wait for confirmation, our quorum, our quorum would like to do some introductions. On the executive committee are myself, Peter Muir, chair and governor at large, Neil Campbell, vice chair, governor at large, Terry Palachuk, vice chair representing Vancouver Island, Keith Switzer, chair, finance and audit committee and governor at large. The other important bo board members are Berga Anderson representing the North, Dale Gregory representing Vancouver, Coast, Vancouver Coastal Fraser, George Horner representing the Thompson Okanagan, Mark McKenzie representing the Kootenays, Janice Mori is a governor at large. Our exceptional operation teams team are Scott Brady, CEO, Melissa Sim, Member Service Manager, Will Sutton, Competitions Manager, Kim Dennis, Education and Camps Coordinator, Rebecca Connup Price, Communications and Marketing Manager, Lindsay Shannon, Administrative Coordinator, Melissa Sego, High Performance Director, Patty Caldwell, Chief Umpire, and Mimi Lichito, Financial Coordinator. Hopefully, I've provided enough time for Lindsay to provide, to, for Lindsay to confirm that we have a quorum and to provide us with the number of voting members present. Peter, we have 25 voting members present. With 25 voting members present, for a motion to pass, we'll require 14, vote, 14 votes. Thank you, Lindsay. Prior to starting on, we'll just do a quick overview. This being our first virtual AGM, I would like to go over some of the proceedings. First, I must warn you, I may get a little tongue-tied. Being dyslexic, I know my brain and mouth do, not get, uh, do get out of whack sometimes, so please forgive me now. Voting members, delegates, please use the chat feature for communication and voting. Phone in delegates, Please send a message to Al Shannon at curlbc.ca and they will be added to our chat feature. Oh, I'm sorry, I just noticed that I got it wrong. The um, for required for votes and favors 13. Thank you, Scott. Um, during our discussions, just send us a quick message first. For example, in Penticton, I have a comment. Send that immediately, then we'll know that we'll have to wait for your next message to come in. We will only be asking if you're opposed to a motion when we call a vote. This is to simplify our process during this time. Again, if you've just joined us, I need to inform you that the AD AGM is being recorded and closed captioning is available. Next item, approval of the agenda. Please review the agenda. I want to ask if there are any amendments to the agenda. Please use the chat feature to provide us with any amendments, include your club name. I have a message here from Ken McKinnon asking, hope, hope can only chat with all panelists and not individuals. And uh, we got a message here saying that, yes, we can see your comments, okay. Uh, seeing no additions or changes, uh, at this time I'd like to call for a vote. The motion was moved by Abbotsford and Ken Bird from Abbotsford and seconded by Torben Wilson Esquamot. I Squamo, all right, sorry. I call for a vote. Are there any oppositions? Please use the chat feature.
Seeing none, the motion is passed with no opposed. Oops. Wrong button, sorry. Next item is the approval of the agenda. Please review the minutes from the last AGM held, up, held on June 8th, 2019. Please use the chat feature to inform us of any changes or clarifications. Seeing none, I'd like to call for a vote. The vote was moved by Ron McDonald of Kamloops and seconded by Terry Holly of Golden Ears. Please use the chat feature if you're opposed. Seeing none, the motion is passed with, passed with none opposed. On behalf of the board, I like to also, on behalf of the board, I would also like to especially welcome our life and honorary life members attending the AGM. In addition, welcome to Curling Canada's Chair, John Shea, who will be providing us with an update from the national perspective in a moment. Due to a family commitment, Kerning Canada's CEO, Catherine Henderson, was not able to attend. This has been a year for the history books. We started this season with a plan for 2020 to be our celebration year, marking our 125th anniversary of curling in BC. Then COVID-19 hit and forced both Curling BC and Curling Canada to make decisions we did not expect to have to make in our lifetime. It is sometimes lost that the board is a volunteer board and has dedicated their time to the organization in addition to their other volunteering activities as well as their own jobs. Not only does the board attend numerous meetings, but they work with Curling Canada and other provincial curling organizations organizations, our government partners, and of course, our clubs and their curlers. I must admit, sometimes it seemed like a full-time job. It is with sadness I mentioned that three board members lost members of their family during the past year. I did have to step away from, and did have to step away from their volunteer roles. Personally, I would have to thank the board and staff for their dedication while for four months I was dealing with my father being injured and later passing away in Ontario. The board continues to evolve, making governance decisions with a vision for the long term for our sport in BC. Yes, members of our curling family may not agree with the board, but the board has made adjustments based on constructive feedback. Even with a stressful year, the organization has made significant progress in a number of areas and continue to plan to grow the game in the future. The world has changed with more regulations and the board has, ha has had to adapt and must meet new government guidelines. For example, all board members are required to take and pass the Commit to Kids online training course and sign con conflict of interest forms. On behalf of the board, I'd like to extend our thanks to all of the curling family volunteers in the province that have helped made KC, B, Curl BC proud to be one of the best provincial organizations, not, in B, not only in BC, but in Canada. I'm pleased to have had this opportunity to lead the team of dedicated volunteers and professionals. Thank you. 
Our next item is the presentation of the 2019-20 financial statements. On behalf of Keith, on behalf of Keith Switzer, Chair of Finance and Audit Committee, I'd like to call upon Scott Braley, Curl Cur BC CEO, to present the financial report. Scott, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Peter, and, and thanks to you and the board. You're a great group to work with. We're, we're very lucky to have volunteers like all of you. Great to see 120 people on the call. This is a record for us and, and so many clubs represented, so, so much appreciated. I know you all look forward to the, the finance report, although I, I have been asked to try and shorten it up, so I, which I can't understand, of course. I know everybody enjoys it, but we uh, will have two reports for you today, plus an update. Uh, we, we've already received some questions about COVID. Uh, we will do an, a COVID update after the formal AGM is completed, and uh, Kim Dennis will be leading us on that. Uh, what we're going to start with, though, is this finance report, and if, if any of you uh, have it available to you, this green book, which uh, Peter has put up on the screen here, is the document I'm going to be referring to because it contains the auditor's report um, as well as some commentary. So what we'll do is three things. We'll look at the results from the past fiscal year, which ended March 31st, see what the auditor had to say about uh, the financials that we provided to them, and then ask you for a motion to reappoint Baker Tilly as auditors for Curl BC. So what is your role here? Um, you, you should, if you can, from this, know what the principal sources of revenue are for Curl BC and also where they're spent. And be aware of the financial statements and the auditor's report. So hopefully with the information you've received ahead of time and, and this update here, you'll, you'll feel comfortable in knowing all the, the, that information. So that green book has the details, but bottom line, it was a break-even year. And we were actually uh, satisfied with break-even, not only because we're a nonprofit, but uh, just given uh, the situation we were in and some events having to be canceled, um, we, we uh, were kind of uh, a sigh of relief to uh, have a break-even. Um, something we'll talk about in a moment are the, the three different funds that we have, but here are the balances and the one that you particularly should take note of is the general fund of 191,000. Altogether, the three funds that we have add up to 280,000, but that general fund is unrestricted. That's the one we'd like to grow. So the general fund is for core operations in all four pillars. Now, what are these pillars? Well, for those of you unfamiliar, the, the, the names are participation, performance, member engagement, and partnerships, which is that big external world out there. We try to align our strategic plan, our end statements, our financial statements, all around those four pillars. And so that's how we operate and make sure we have a focus. The restricted fund uh, sometimes throws people off, but it's, it's a way of accounting for government grants that come in near the end of the year, such as hosting BC grants in March, that are really for the next fiscal year. So the auditor's view of that is that they, they are restricted, they haven't been spent yet, and we need to, although it's revenue in the year, it's not really part of the general fund or unrestricted. And finally, the capital assets are, is what we have invested funds in uh, over the past years, including um, six sets of curling stones, for example, would be a big capital asset we have. So how did we get here? Well, this the first row there shows you the pattern in the restricted fund. As I mentioned before, we're, we're not as concerned with that. That just varies depending on how much uh, government grant revenue we get before the end of March, which is actually for the next fiscal year. The unrestricted fund, we keep a close eye on and you see it dip down significantly in 2018, 
but the other three years have been positive and so we would like to continue that positive trend. So where are we at? Uh, you, you saw the numbers a moment ago for 2020. So if you go back to 2017, you'll see there was only uh, the three hosting grants that were sitting there, uh, each for $3,000, This year we, we have uh, five hosting grants that add up to 18,000 in the restricted. Unrestricted has gone up and down a bit, but uh, back good news back up about 9,000 this year. Uh, we'd like to get that over 200,000 for next year. And the property and equipment you see uh, has gone down and that's due to amortization. Even though we purchased about 10,000 in equipment again this year, uh, the amortization is about 16,000 and then it, uh, it ends up going down. This graph, you may have a little trouble seeing it on the screen here, but this is on the front of the Green Book. And the, the purpose here is to try and answer the, one of those questions right from the beginning of the presentation is, what is the source of the money? And we divide it up into five areas, which are on the right-hand side there, programs, sponsorship, championships, affiliation, and government. And of those, I'm sure you're concerned about affiliation, how much is that? And that beige amount out over member services there is represents about 25% of the revenue that comes in is through affiliation fees. What this means is that we're matching membership fees by a ratio of three to one. And that is very positive. So uh, the board had set long ago a, a minimum ratio of two to one that they wanted to see membership fees uh, as an investment that was matched two to one. We now match three to one with that. So you'll see government um, revenue in all four of those pillars. And so government, very significant uh, contributor, uh, particularly the provincial government, although we, we do have some federal contributions as well, and the odd municipal contribution, mainly provincial government, a very uh, similar um, amount uh, that we receive from government as we do uh, for membership fees. So what's it spent on? We, there, there's four areas we mentioned here for you, administration, programs and services, championships, and staffing. So staffing often stands out as something that gets uh, scrutinized. Uh, we, the amount spent on staffing is about 29% of the total expenses. We try to keep it under 30%. It, it ranges between 20 and 30 uh, in a given year. And the other uh, big area of expenditure there, obviously championships in not in member services, but in the other three areas. And that's in part due to the fact we include hosting grant, or sorry, hosting budgets in our statements from the various BC championships. And so that increases the, both the revenue and expense uh, in the championship area. So this page has a fair bit of detail about from the audited statements. I'm just going to point out a couple of things. The, uh, cash went down, but the receivables went up because they're, they're directly related. The receivables are mainly to do with sponsorship money that wasn't received by the end of the year and membership fees that there was some delay in. Uh, all of these receivables are uh, collectible. Uh, it's just that we, um, we had to cut off March 31st and what the auditor does is check at the end of April to see if any of them have been paid and indeed uh, over 20,000 have been paid by then and, and signif significantly more since then. With regard to the payables, they're up uh, significantly and that's in part due to the fact that the rock slide uh, cur curling camp fees had to be moved from deferred revenue into the payable section. And that's about 37,000 that would normally be called deferred revenue for that summer camp which the auditor became aware that we were canceling the camp and uh, ultimately had to refund all that money. So they switched that to become a payable. Holiday time also went up and that's mainly to do with staff having to work events and coaching events. And so, uh, but in the spring and the summer, they're able to 
uh, use up a lot of that time. You also see a number of notes, more than ever this time, because they've added a note uh, about the COVID-19 impact. Uh, you're welcome to look at any of those notes to get more information, certainly further welcome to ask me if you have any questions about those notes. Uh, finally, their schedules, the three schedules there, include additional information to demonstrate the diversity of, of grant funding we receive at both the national and federal level. The auditor's report is qualified, but this is consistent for nonprofit organizations that include events in their financial statement, which they're not running directly. So we have a certain budget, for example, for the men's and women's championships, but then the Cranbrook Curling Club is running their budget and then they report to us and provide us with their revenue and expense statement. And uh, that is included as part of the, the package. It's about 200,000 a year in both revenue and expense that is included to better demonstrate the, the scope of the operation. And of course, at times we have national and inter international events that are hosted in BC as well. So uh, that's the part the auditor can't audit. And, and so that's why they put in this qualifying statement. It doesn't have any net impact on trophy statements. So page three, if you have your green book open, is showing a comparison of the current results to the budget that, and you'll see that we had significantly more revenue and expense, and that's in part due to the inclusion of national and BC championships in both the revenue and expense uh, to uh, increase everything to 1.73 million in revenue and expense. There is also a, a budget on that page that uh, includes uh, the, the current fiscal year, although we've obviously had to do some different projections for the current year, which leads us to 2020, 2021 and beyond. We are looking to continue to do a number of things here. One is the keep a long-term focus and encourage, encourage strategic thinking by revising our strategic plan. We continue to measure outcomes, both financial and others. We provide monthly updates on the financial statements to the board and we respond to changes like COVID and you'll hear more about that at the end of the meeting. We've um, established framework for an operational reserve policy. Uh, we, we haven't actually allocated any funds to that until we understand fully the uh, impact of COVID on this current season. And Finally, we uh, continue to attempt to diversify revenue by encouraging, for example, philanthropic contributions through the BC Amateur Sport Fund and growing other fundraising op options. Peter, I, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I think I did better than during our practice, but uh, um, are there any questions? might have lulled them to sleep, but I do see one question coming. Scott. Scott, can you see the question from Paul River? I do. Um, yeah, the, this is where the question, if you can't see it, is it appears you're allocating all of the admin expenses to membership. What that That is where it is recorded in our financial statements. And we, um, so the answer is yes, it's both. 12 or 13% of, of all expenses. Um, obviously, a lot of it is overhead that covers um, all four pillars, but that is where it's recorded. I don't see any other questions. Oh, one more.
Okay. Uh, next one is that reality shouldn't be allocated. It, it could. It would just become more complicated. It's it's really a uh, by doing it this way, you can. I, I'm able to say to you, 12% is on for admin, uh, rather than having to kind of go through each pillar and say it's 2% here and 1% there. So it's really uh, not complicating, uh, a way of not complicating things. Um, how does deferred revenue become an accounts payable? The uh, that is to do with the auditors uh, reviewing the. The, uh, what we provided to them. And at, at the time we provided the information, it, we had not canceled the rock slide camp. That was a decision made after the auditor had received the information. And so they, in their judgment, they felt that this 37,000 we collected and we're going to have to refund was a payable, not a deferred revenue. It's, it, it only impacts the balance statement. It, it didn't impact the income state. Uh, Scott? Yes. Um, I have a request from a, a, one of our attendees to please read the question before you answer them because not uh, I don't think everybody can see the questions. Okay, yes, I saw that come up. I, I, unfortunately, once I answered them, they're gone, but the, the question, um, the previous question was about how did uh, deferred revenue turn into a payable? That was that one. Scott, did you see the question from Lumbee Curling Club? Let's see. It's on the chat. Oh, on chat. Yes. Yeah, the, the um, affiliation fees increase was, it's, um, it went from $17 to $20. So, that was an extra three, and also uh, we were charging uh, $20 for all regular curlers, uh, whereas previously some of them were being charged $10. Um, uh, now there's a second, so uh, the, the question I guess is, although the chat I think everybody can see, can they? Am I right? I think no, it would not just if be helpful. On the phone. Yeah, it would just be helpful if you would read the questions out before you answer them, Scott. Um, uh, yeah, it appears the affiliation fees have increased by 20% or 75,000. However, expenses have not increased. Where did this increase come from? So I just explained that and yes, it's due to the increase in the memberships. There is also a eight or 9,000 municipal grant we have recorded there because we had uh, nowhere to record it. It was done through one of our clubs. Something else on Q&A, let's just see. Um, the question on Q&A, wondering if a small percentage of money has been put aside for competitive curlers with disability or other unique groups. We, we do budget in this area each year and, and the staff's often successful in accessing grants to assist um, the, and just kudos to our BC wheelchair curling team, which always does the, the best job of raising money by using the BC Amateur Sport Trust Fund to, uh, to um, raise funds for their group. Another one, uh, it says, perhaps one person can be the moderator asking questions to the speaker on behalf of the audience. So uh, that's another possibility. I don't see anything else, Peter. Okay, thank Thanks you. Thanks for those questions. Thank you, Scott. Thank you everyone for the questions. Again, Scott uh, is available by email if there's any other questions you have. Next item is the appointment of the auditor. As required every year, we must consider and approve the appointment of the auditor for the next fiscal year. We have enjoyed excellent support from Baker Tilly and reflecting this, note that we have a motion identified to reappoint Baker Tilly as the auditor for Curl BC for the 2021 fiscal year as moved by Abbotsford and seconded by 100 Mile. The floor is open for any discussion. Again, please use chat.
Having no discussion or questions, I'd like to now call for the vo vote on this motion. Please use the chat feature only if you're opposed. The motion was passed with none opposed. Thank you. Curling Canada update. Please welcome Curling Canada's board chair, John Shea. John, it's over to you. Oh, thanks, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of myself and Catherine Henderson and Paul Addison, who's a fellow governor who's on the call today as well, uh, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Curl BC, Scott Braley, your CEO, Peter Muir, your president, chair, the board, all the other regional governors, and all the other attendees today, your light, honorary lifeline members. Just like to thank you for asking us uh, to come today and thank you all for your support throughout the past season and through this pandemic that we're going through right now. Uh, Curl BC has been a great leader in the room and I'd like to give kudos to uh, Scott Braley. Catherine Henderson wanted me to pass along those remarks. Scott has been very instrumental in the weekly meetings that have been occurring since the middle of March with Curling Canada and his fellow executive directors from across the country. Uh, Scott has brought great leadership to the room and we're very grateful for Scott's participation in those meetings. It's been a different year. I don't know what to say. I think there's going to be an interesting conversation I want to hang around for after the uh, your AGM is done to hear about COVID. Uh, definitely there's lots of questions. There's more questions than there are answers at this time and point. Um, I don't have a lot of answers for you um, as you're Scott is involved again. I will, you know, lean on Scott a fair bit here because this is an operational matter and the direction is coming from there. But I can assure you that our operational senior management team is working strongly with their fellow uh, reps as Scott and other MA pre uh, executive directors to figure out how we're going to work our way through this process. Some of the stumbling blocks that we're all aware of is that you know, when it comes to health, it boils down to provincial and public health authorities. So how the picture of the landscape is gonna look this fall is gonna be different in every province and every territory potentially, depending where we're gonna be in the next number of months. Um, Curl BC, Peter, thank you for this past year um, and the, your board uh, for your support with Curling Canada and everything that's happened. Uh, we'd like to let you know, uh, this is Catherine's remarks, I'm kind of bouncing here a bit, but Scott has been actively involved in our working groups and especially around the return to play, which is going to be coming out in the end of, towards the end of June, as well as the collection of curler data that we will need towards helping us with federal funding and provincial funding for all curling clubs and provincial associations. I can tell you from personal experience, Curl, this, Curl BC is considered one of the top provinces in terms of understanding their curlers. I have seen this myself up front and personal when I've attended your meetings. Um, you guys have been very active in your infrastructure and your curling center advocacy. And we enjoy the partnership in all of these. I tip my hat to you and your, curl, your junior uh, program. It is one of the strongest programs in the country. And again, that goes to the board and to all of you, as well as Scott and his team. Um, you know, there's, I'm willing to take a few questions. Uh, currently what's taking place, you can see some things have happened. We did a BDO presentation in the past, uh, last Friday and Monday, one in the Anglophone version, the other in the Francophone version. We had 180 clubs uh, participate in the uh, call last Friday, and we had 20 clubs participate on the call on Monday where BDO went through a whole process of helping clubs understand how to work through COVID and the financial process at this time and point. Um, we had a virtual call a week ago with all of our MA presidents and we brought our staff on so that all the MA presidents were given an update as to where we stand, what's taking place so that they can share that with their boards as well as with their executive directors. Um, our number one goal at this time and point is communication. Uh, I can't stress that enough. The only way that we are going to work our way through this is being a united front. And there are no secrets. We need to go and talk to each other and work our way through it. And we will get through this. And 
you know, I look forward to getting to the other side of this, as I'm sure the rest of you do as well. So, Peter, that's really all that I have. Um, unless there's something in particular you'd like me to mention that I've missed. No, that's great. Thank you very much, John. Okay, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. John, it's been a pleasure working with Curling Canada over the past three years. On behalf of Curl BC, I'd like to thank Curling Canada's volunteer board and their operation team for their dedication and hard work. I'd also like to thank Curling Canada's CEO, Catherine Henderson, for the amount of time Curling Canada is spending lobbying the federal government on behalf of the curling, on behalf of curling to ensure we receive as much government funding as possible during this unprecedented time. It has also been great working with other provincial and territory associations from coast to coast to coast. I do like that saying. Thank you, John, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Well, thank you, Peter. And I just want to give a quick shout out to my teammate from 2018 at the Strathcona Cup, Dale Gregory. I just want to tell him that I saw his name on the list today and I just wanted to say hello. Uh, John, before you go, it's Lindsay here. We have a question from one of our clubs as to whether or not the BDO financial presentation material is available online. It is. Uh, it is being put up. I can go and I'll get back to Scott on Monday and he can go and post it up. But yes, that is the uh, plan is that all clubs, the, both calls were recorded and the, any club can go on and look at it as many times as they so wish. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the operations report. Once again, I'd like to call upon Scott to present our operation report. Scott. Thanks, Peter, and, and just a big thank you to John for all those kind words. And uh, we, we've been spending a lot of time together on Zoom calls or whatever the types of calls they are with uh, Curling Canada over the, the past three months, as you can imagine. So uh, great teamwork and um, well done for Curling Canada's leadership there. And uh, if you aren't aware, John is the person that started the National Curling Club Insurance Program, and so a lot of you benefit from that. And uh, it, up until this day, and so John, thanks for that initiative, which has had a huge impact across the country. Um, the the uh, strategic plan update. The, uh, the I'm now uh, going to draw you over to the blue book if you have that, and the blue book uh, you see the cover there it has been put together by the staff and and uh, Rebecca kind of Price in particular has to pull all our comments together. But just, it is my opportunity to say a big thank you again to the staff for another great year. They are extremely productive and show great leadership. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, work with them. The, uh, we mentioned the four pillars and this book is organized in those four pillars. And so we'll provide you with a quick snapshot and uh, either the staff or I can take questions after this if you have any about it. So we'll start with member engagement and that this pillar is viewed to be the, the most important by the board. Uh, they formed an end statement about member engagement in 2017 under Paul Addison's leadership as chair. And it was unanimous that this, this was the area we, we had to, um, you know, put more resources in and, and have, have a more of a, a connection with our membership. So uh, hopefully that you've felt that in the last couple of years. The, um, with regard to membership, you, you see the number of regular curlers has gone up over 23,000. Now you, that's listed as an increase. For some of you who've been around a while, you'd say, well, it used to be 25,000. Well, that was because we were counting duplicates. There were 5% of the membership was playing up two or three clubs. So, and, and still do. So they're, they're actually over 23,000 unique curlers now. So that, that's an increase upwards. 80% of the clubs re received assistance from Curl BC staff over the past year. And we'd like it to be a hundred, but that, that's pretty good using the 80-20 rule. And any of you who haven't reached out, please do so. Uh, we do have Jack Bowman helping with gaming grants, for example, and Melissa Sim does all sorts of uh, assistance throughout the year with various other types of grants. 
this area of member engagement education, uh, Carol BC is considered uh, the, the leader in the province of, of all provincial sport organizations for its educational programming. So uh, big thank you to Kim Dennis here for uh, picking up uh, th this area and um, expanding upon it. In, in this area, we, we have three main groups here, the coaching education, the officials education, and the ice tech education. And you get a sense there of all the workshops and the number of people. I was adding them up before the meeting. I don't know if I can find it here. And it's, it's pretty significant. And you'll see that all throughout the province, 26 workshops, 260 people, and uh, trying to cover every region each year. Partnerships, that's that big world out there outside of curling and government certainly is a key partner for us. And uh, we were able to uh, get 421,000 in uh, provincial government grants this year, in addition to 100,000 for uh, the hosting grant for the Tim Hortons Briar in 2021. Uh, if you're wondering about that hosting grant, it, it comes to Curl BC and then we send it to Curling Canada. The same thing happened last year with the uh, World Women's. We were able to access the 100, send it to Curling Canada, and then convince the government not to, uh, <laughs> for them not to ask for it back. So, so we do play a role in, in that transfer of money. Uh, something the staff's been working on, Melissa Sim and Kim Dennis, the uh, developing a closer relationship with TechSafe BC and the RFABC, which is the Recreational Facilities Association of BC. These two groups in Curl BC have been working on um, how the, the whole ammonia plant issue and what we need to uh, be saying to clubs and, and encouraging clubs in terms of safety protocols and so on. So it's, we, we have much stronger ties this year, so it's, it's very good. Uh, continuing uh, with partnerships on the philanthropic end, um, we now have 10 clubs with BC Amateur Sport Fund projects. Our, we actually have 15 funds in total, which include uh, the Optimists and Curl BC has two, and a couple of clubs have, have two funds. I had an inquiry yesterday about a club who wanted to add another fund. So the, the reason you would do this is so that you could raise money uh, from your members or volunteers, supporters, and provide them with a tax receipt. That's the purpose of the BC Amateur Sport Fund. And the, applying for a project, just a one-page form, which you send to me, I sign off on it, send it to Sport BC, which administers the fund. It's a 5% fee uh, that they take, and we don't take any fee, so it's, it's a good way to get additional donations. Well done to the whole staff and board that uh, established a, uh, last year, a golf tournament and silent auction in conjunction with the uh, Business of Curling Symposium in Kamloops. Unfortunately, we had to cancel this this year and instead we're doing this virtual meeting, but the plan is to do this each year now and it's a way of raising money for the Curling for Life Endowment Fund, which resides in the Vancouver Foundation. That's where that fund is held and contribution is sent to Curl BC, approximately 5% interest from that fund is sent to support curling each year in perpetuity. And last but certainly not least, I know he's on the line, Al Kersey. He came in yesterday and did a COVID presentation to Peter Muir of a check for this year's fundraising that we, we actually had to use a, uh, a curling broom and uh, with them with masks on. So we'll, we'll have to use that picture uh, for next year. And uh, the, uh, uh, th this was really a great effort by Al and a number of the volunteers on the call here because they had to do a lot of the sales online. They, they simply couldn't complete the project because um, everybody was kind of in quarantine. So, so well done and thanks. 
Good, uh, always good to know, uh, know there's new sponsors and new partners. Original 16 came in as the presenting sponsor of the BC Club Challenge. So uh, ideal sponsor for that. And they were very keen to be involved with any club that would be interested in promoting their product. And uh, they, they're big supporters of curling in Western Canada and also of curling, uh, curling Canada. Czech TV came in as the uh, broadcast sponsor for the, the men's and the women's, and they provided us with 12 hours of broadcast time, which is, is quite significant. Um, we, we're hoping to do this with them again uh, next year in, in Kamloops. They certainly put on a good show. And also good news uh, with one of our longtime sponsors, we, we think it's been 18 years, somewhere 18 to 20 years, Best Western has been a sponsor and they've signed on for another three years. So, so that, that was very nice of them to do that. Uh, Bel Air Direct continues to be our biggest sponsor. Um, their affinity program now has, I believe it's 550 uh, Curl BC members involved. So thanks to all of you who are getting either your home or auto insurance through that program. Under external communications, this is Rebecca's area where she led the uh, implementation of a new website, which you probably noticed, and the, the whole staff helped her with that. Uh, it's a big job, and we had an external consultant to help us with that and, and sort of brought us more up to date and made it more accessible through different uh, mediums. mediums. I was just checking before the meeting, and uh, oh, before you leave there, um, that there's been a big increase in our uh, social media. Uh, Facebook, we now have 2,600, Twitter, 1,900, and Instagram, 1,500 followers. So, so great to see that sort of interest. The website itself had 88,000 unique visitors again this year. So it's, it's quite a reach we have. The other uh, project we, we never would have dreamt had turned out this way, but we, uh, we started this year with the idea of the 125th anniversary of curling celebrations. And of course it's got interrupted, but we're looking forward to that, uh, reinstating that in the fall and carrying on those celebrations. Under participation at the youth development and under 15, uh, we're, we're doing more and more in this area. And uh, pleased to say that we had a full slate of teams, eight boys and eight girls teams, that in the BC Winter Games in Fort St. John, Fort St. John did a great job. Well done to Kim Dennis up there and her crew and the uh, really top, top marks from BC Games afterwards for curling. It, it, it couldn't have been a, a better report card that, that, that we received. And, and they said, well, you know, absolutely, going to be a core sport in 2022 in Vernon for the BC Winter Games, so all very positive. Uh, we <clears throat> started for the first time this year the Tim Hortons Hit Draw Tap program. We pilot, piloted it in Cranbrook, and thanks to Elkford, who sent over both volunteers and kids to try it out, and we're looking forward to doing this program again in Kelowna as part of the and uh, the Rocks and Rings program, we, we actually don't run that directly anymore. Rock Solid Productions is running that for us. And they ran six Curling 101 programs at different clubs this year involving 2,500 students. And what it means is they go into the school, do the Rocks and Rings, and then uh, get those, some of those kids into the clubs. Under the U18 division uh, retention, we uh, had uh, almost 100 kids at last year's Rockside summer camp, so it was a sellout. And it, so it's uh, disappointing, I think, for everyone not to be able to carry that on this year. But we'll look forward to doing it again in 2021, and thanks to uh, Kelowna Curling Club, which hosts that uh, uh, camp each year. Winfield Curling Club, thanks to them for hosting the BC High School Curling Championships. Those are, are run separately from Curl BC, but uh, great to see that program carrying on. 
And finally, there were 24 coaches in Fort St. John that uh, took back part in uh, some coach mentorship program. That year. With regard to stick curling for the first time, the, the BC Stick Curling Championships were run under Curl BC's auspices. So a big thanks to them for, for joining us and thanks to Peter Muir who did the terms of reference and we were able to um, go from having two separate groups to one group together and it was a big success. I think the only downside was the champions weren't able to play in the nationals because it, it was uh, canceled. So hopefully they'll be able to play next year. Interesting, the two divisions are open and one. So I believe there were close to 24 teams in that event. So those two events. The, thanks to Delta Thistle, which uh, we helped them get a grant for getting wheelchair curling participation increased. And you see the picture there, uh, lots of people involved. Uh, it was a weekly program, uh, a big success to start off. So, so thanks to Delta for, for working on that and Melissa Sim for that initiative. And finally, a shout out to our friends at Fernie Curling Club that was finally able to reopen after their tragedy of a couple of years ago. And uh, over a hundred people came back to curl after waiting all that time. So, so very good sign and are just well done. So this was a good moment at the, the last curling count in CC a National Curling Congress and Peter and Terry Balanchuk were there to accept the Curling Canada Foundation Cup for best average performance at national youth events. What that uh, is referencing is the Canadian under 21 and Canadian under 18 events. All four uh, of BC's teams uh, that year had medal performances. We know that Team Tardy went on to win the world championship. So arguably one of the best junior programs, not only in Canada, but in the world. And a big shout out to Melissa Sligo and Will Sutton and all the performance coaches and consultant coaches who help with that program each year and, and lead the kids. So on the men's and women's tour side, I, most of you know that we finally established a Curl BC tour and it uh, had 25 teams participating and, and that's one of the ways teams can qualify for the, the BC Men's and Women's Championship. We mentioned uh, Czech TV earlier and they combined with Roll Focus, which is our production company from Victoria to do the broadcasting. We had Melissa Sligo and Jerry Richard do our commentary again. And there was also a, a crew at the Czech TV office in Victoria um, and they would throw back and forth from uh, Victoria to Cranbrook and it, it was very well done. So nice job. CBC Sports continues to stream these events as well. And the uh, Pro BC uh, has a uh, YouTube channel that is getting pretty good viewership. So uh, thanks to Cranbrook for all their uh, Cranbrook Curling Club and the city of Cranbrook for their contribution of their arena uh, for about 10 or 11 days. So it's quite significant. We're looking forward to joining uh, Kamloops Curling Club and MacArthur Island Curling Club in 2021 at the MacArthur Island Center Olympic Ice Spring. Finally, on the uh, coach development side and performance, you'll see uh, there were, were four coaches that were mentored at Rock Slide last year. Nine more coaches became competition coach certified, which is very important for our uh, competitive junior program. And 23 more people took uh, the competition coach courses. So, so good sign that that, that that educational program is very robust. Peter, that's a, a quick overview of the blue book and all the, the work the staff did to put, put it together. I don't know if there's any questions. Looks like there's some Q&A there. Um, there's quite a long one here from Lumby about affiliation fees have gone up significantly for a small club. 
This year, with the inclusion of the under 13, our fees will go up another 20%. This would mean that over the last three years, our affiliation fees have doubled. With strategic planning, would it be more feasible to increase regular curler fees as opposed to including the U13 in trying to increase revenue? Last year, the fees increased by 20%. What is the budget for this year's increase and why? Uh, yeah, there, there's no planned increase this year. Uh, we, with regard to the U13, that's certainly something the um, board can consider. Uh, just for everybody's information, it is the board that sets the membership fees each year. The idea with the under 13 was to charge $10, not 20. So it, we, we did allow for last year to be a transition. However, COVID obviously impacts everything. And so we'll, we'll have to see in the next two or three months uh, what the board wants to do about this. If everybody's able to fully open and, and run all their programs, um, then we would expect just to a status quo on that, those membership fees. And so hopefully that provides some explanation. I'm, I'm sure the board uh, can consider the comments further uh, when we meet after this meeting. Um, I see another question from Dawson Creek. Uh, welcome to Jeff. And, and if you don't know uh, Jeff Ginter, manager there, uh, we uh, just recently combined with Curling Alberta to have a joint membership for the Peace Clubs. And this means that hopefully seven Peace Clubs will be back uh, part of both Curling uh, Alberta and Curl BC next year. Two quick comments related to membership services. Number one, the overall percent of money spent seems alarmingly low in the program category, which is the most grassroots portion of business, especially if the board has said it is the highest priority. And number two, there seems to be little or no programs course delivered in the north. We would appreciate comments on both questions. Yeah. I think on the first one, you're probably the majority of money, I, I was noticing that as well when I was looking at the graph that, um, I'm seeing there's one of the staffs ready to answer. So uh, let me just, I'll do part of the answer to say that um, a lot of the money we spend in this area is on the staff working with the clubs. So Melissa Sim working with Delta Thistle to access a grant for them and uh, then um, increasing wheelchair curling participation, for example. In the, um, with regard to program in the North, I, I would certainly say there's educational, substantial educational programming, but uh, let me throw it to Kim. Are you there? Oh, here we go. Sorry, a uh, little bit of lag. So we have been quite busy in the North in the last couple of years and have been very successful um, also applying and receiving grants to help us um, to reach more communities up there. So a few examples, uh, we hosted a 40 kids camp in Kitimat last year. Uh, we also trained 60 officials in Quinell. This year we went to Fraser Lake to host a competition course there as well as a club coach youth in Prince George leading up to the Women's World's Curling uh, because they were going to offer some um, spring break um, programming for kids and then we did make our way up to Fort St. John to do an officiating course this year as well so um, you know we're being as active as we can when those requests do come in to make sure that we are getting to all of our communities in the province. Very good thanks Kim a better answer than mine um, and um, I, Jeff, I, we, we can certainly talk more about that in, in, the, in the coming weeks and, and just some ideas you may have with the peace area. I, I have another question from uh, Herb Wong about the, uh, what is the balance of the Curling for Life Endowment Fund and what's the annual distribution? Well, it, it was up to 60,000. Unfortunately, with the impact of COVID, it went down a bit because it is invested in a conservative way by the Vancouver Foundation. I believe the current balance is about 55,000. We receive uh, about 2,100 uh, this year from it. So it's about 5% of, of um, whatever the proceeds are. And so 
I mean, when we first created it 10 years ago, we were hoping by now we'd, it would be worth a million dollars and we'd be at 50,000 a year, but that'll only happen if we have, um, you know, some more significant donations. Having said that, I just, a big thank you to all of you on the call who have made contributions. I know some of them have been very significant. We, we had one person donate $10,000, for example. So that, that's a big deal when they do that. And so um, I, I would just encourage others to, to do that, or, or if you have already, encourage more people. And then we will have another source of revenue. That's the, the idea. Thanks for, for asking. And uh, is there uh, anything else? Uh, no, Scott, nothing else has shown up. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to you, Peter. Thanks, thank you, Scott. Uh, Scott, on behalf of the board and the Curley family, I'd like to thank the entire operations team for their dedication and hard work over the past year. We would not be one of the best without all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Next item is Governor at Large Election. The nomination com committee received only two candidate submissions for the two openings. With no ele elections required, I'd like to introduce Terry Haas and Brendan Lewis. Uh, information on them was sent out earlier um, in a news release. But we do require a motion. The motion to elect Terry Haas and Brendan Willis as new governor at large onto the Curl BC Board of Governors by acclamation was moved by Mission Granted and seconded by Royal City. At this time, I'd like to call for a vote. If you're opposed to the motion, please use the chat feature. Seeing none, the motion was passed uh, the motion was passed with none opposed. Thank you. Uh, introduction of new regional governors. Dale Gregory was acclaimed and will be re representing Vancouver Coastal Fraser Region, Region 11, for the third term, for his third term on the board. Our new regional governor elections for Thompson Okanagan Regions 3, 4, and 7 was held prior to the AGM. And I'm pleased to welcome new to the board, Sean Everest, representing Thompson Okanagan. The new governors will take office at Mealy following the AGM. And thanks to the nomination committee for all their hard work. Induction, the board recommended Ted, ba Ted Bassett be inducted as an honorary life member. Ted Bassett is being recognized for his support of Junior Curling and for the Anita Cochran Memorial Junior Spear, Spill held annually at the Royal City Curling Club. Only you, the members, can approve this induction. The, most, the motion to induct Ted Bassett as an honorary life member was moved by Port Moody and seconded by Simon Arm. At this time, I'd like to call for a vote. If you're opposed to the motion, please use the chat feature. Seeing none, the motion was passed with none opposed. Thank you very much. Both Janice Murray and George Horner have completed their third consecutive year as governor. And we are very proud of their contributions they have made to Curl BC, not only in the past six years, but all the previous terms as board members and even to, with the creation of Curl BC. We'll, we will all miss Janice's fundraising events and George's sense of humor. The passion will be missed in the board and I know it will continue in their future endeavors. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for your time and dedication to our sport. I have also completed my third, conse third consecutive term and will fulfill my role as past chair for one more year.
after we had adjourned the AGM, we thought it'd be a good time and an opportunity to provide you with a COVID-19 return to curling status update. I would like to thank Lindsay and Rebecca for putting up with me on our five practice se sessions. Their, their assistance and input is greatly appreciated and I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Citing no for further business, I'd like to call for a motion to adjourn the 2020 AGM. For the last time, please use the chat feature uh, to, and provide a, as we need a mover to conclude the 2020. Thank you, Armstrong. The motion to adjourn was moved by Armstrong. On behalf of the board and the operations team, stay safe and have a great summer. Um, oh, thank you. Um, we've just got a couple of notes coming in. E. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, that Curl BC involved in the AGM did a great job. Thank you. Uh, now for the COVID-19 return to curling update. S sorry, but due to an early unexpected closure at this time at the Curl BC office where some of our members are located, we're only going to be able to go to around 20 after uh, two at the latest. At this time, I'd like to pass it over to Kim. Kim, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, everyone, for staying tuned to uh, listen to our Return to Curling update. Um, it is my privilege um, to provide an update with you today. Um, and I do encourage you to ask any questions in the Q&A section. Due to the time limit today, we will compile a list of any answer unanswered questions into an FAQ to be posted on our COVID-19 resource page on our website. Um, so currently our plan is still in the draft stages as we are combining the best practices and guidance from the Provincial Health Office, BC's Restart Plan, BIA Sport, RFA BC, BC RPA, and WorkSafe BC. So we do aim to provide a guideline that can give enough flexibility for all of our clubs and centers to adapt the measures being recommended. Our return to curling will be achieved with careful planning, preparation, and adaptability. So on your screen, we do have a bit of a timeline. Um, starting in May, we did have Curl BC Regional Cocktails where we met with a large number of our members to hear your concerns, um, have you answer questions, and just have an open conversation with us as we move forward together. At the end of May, the BC Recreation Parks Association released their guidelines. So we have been incorporating their best practice measures into ours. On June 1st, Via Sport um, released their guideline for uh, what we do need to incorporate into all of our sport specific plans. And uh, just recently as well, um, on Wednesday, the BC government uh, did provide an update around liability, which has been a big question uh, in the sports sector. And they have extended liability protection for not-for-profit amateur sport organizations for damages resulting from exposure to COVID-19. Um, and I will note that that is during the state of emergency. Um, so what is unknown, what will happen once um, our province moves out of this pandemic and the state of emergency. Um, following the AGM, we will be putting up some WUFU links and asking members who are interested in joining our working groups um, to help us do some of the more uh, finer details within our guideline and resources for our clubs. So that will be going up onto our COVID-19 resource page and emailed out as well. Um, following that will be our lounge logistics webinar. Uh, we currently have 70 people registered already. That is happening on June 25th, um, and we are still taking registrations for that as well. Jeff Gennard, who joined us at our 2019 Business of Curling Symposium, um, is returning as a guest for us, and he's been working with the hospitality industry in their reopening. So he will be bringing um, the current updates as well as best practices for our clubs in opening our lounges uh, when we return to curling in the fall. Uh, what's still yet to come is the Curling Canada guidelines. Um, 
which is tentatively at the end of the month. Uh, we have received a draft copy, so we've been comparing what we've started with with uh, Curling Canada's and incorporating anything um, that we didn't already have, and we will continue to work with them uh, and collaborate with them moving forward. Um, following that, and along with the work in our working groups, we look to have our guidelines ready early July. So we will continue to provide those updates. Um, you can look for them from Rebecca Connup Price. Um, mid-month and end of the month as we know inf more information moving along. Uh, so uh, here's a little more information on the working group invitations. Um, these slides will be put up. There is a link to the page where we will be putting up uh, the links and we are looking to have a good representation from across the province uh, working on these guidelines so that we have um, the volunteer run clubs voices as well as the staff um, and larger capacity clubs voices in there as well. Okay. Uh, if we could go to the next yep. slide. There you go. All right. So in the meantime, uh, while you are waiting for our guidelines, there is some work that uh, you can be doing with your clubs. And some of you may have already heard this in our cocktail chats that we've been having. Um, so some of the pre-work is working on your COVID-19 safety plan. Um, that will be a requirement for everyone. Uh, creating an illness policy, um, looking at incorporating waivers or acknowledgement of risk forms for any participants uh, coming to play in the fall. Um, working on some facility mapping and physical distancing plan um, and how you can move people within your facilities. Doing a financial forecast, so taking your annual budgets um, and adding in a 4K scenario of a disrupted season, um, you know, business as usual, um, and looking at a potential of no season as well. So there are a few scenarios um, that you can incorporate to help you with making decisions, um, as well as a risk registry. Uh, for those of you that may not have one, we have started a template to get you started that is available on our COVID-19 resource page. Um, if you have any questions, staff, we are available to help you through this um, and or update the one that you might already have to include um, some of the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and then looking at uh, your enhanced cleaning protocols and procedures for, you know, um, hygiene, hand washing, um, all of those things that we've been hearing for the last few months. Um, and I realized I forgot one more thing on the step one. Um, we have a template for a survey that you can send out to your members as well to find out what their level of comfort currently is. Um, and we do, in, as a way of communicating with your members, you are thinking about them, um, helping you to make some decisions on what return to curling may look like in your club, and then continuing to follow up with them um, as things may change as we move forward. So once our Curl BC return to curling guidelines have been approved by our board um, and released, the next step will be for your organization to make your individual return to play plans. So you will be able to incorporate a lot of the pre-work outlined in step one. Um, and then this is where you will be adding in your club's uh, individual modifications uh, because each facility is so unique. So um, you will need to take that into account. Um, and really being able to outline the expectations of your participants, um, including your outbreak plans and your communication plan to your members and your stakeholders. So, you know, as we transition between phases, everybody has a clear picture of what that's going to look like um, and being able to be flexible um, in the event that we move through a phase two to a phase three or even having to take a step back into phase two. Um, and then once your guides are ready, your curling club boards will have to approve the return to play plans um, and then have them either posted in your facility or on your website. And then following that is where, you know, everyone gets to put that hard work uh, into play by implementing and opening preparations in your facilities. So installing any engineered controls or physical distancing measures that you've been planning out. Um, and I would suggest, uh, putting together a virtual walkthrough of the changes to your facility that you may have. So you could take a number of pictures and have them posted up or even do a little video 
uh, that you can share through social media. So everyone has a clear picture of what to expect as they're returning to curling in the fall and making them more comfortable of what that's going to look like. And then step five is we are back to curling. Um, so I go back to my notes here. Oh, I lost my notes. Um, so I haven't checked the chat yet. Um, what I, I do want to close with um, is that, you know, Curl BC, our values of family, excellence, commitment, integrity, respect, and transparency will continue to guide us through these unprecedented times um, so that we can work together and really ensure that, uh, that we have a lot more curling to come in the future. Um, so with that, I'd like to open the floor to, to any questions. Kim, there's sorry, Kim. There's one on the Q and A already, um, okay. and it's the will the upcoming programs you envision include triples curling for the U12s, adult learn to curl, or other groups? Um, sure, I can answer this live. So, um, yes, there is a lot of consideration to what programming is going to look like, and it could be a phased approach as well, really focusing on skill development and then moving to expanding the uh, number of participants um, that we do have within our facilities. Um, so I'm just bringing the rest of the question back up. Um, so yes, there is a lot of consideration of the singles, hit draw trap, uh, mixed doubles um, and triples will be part of consideration. And uh, a sneak peek into one of our working groups will be focusing on programming and uh, the new and creative ways that we can bring people into our sport um, and, and continue to be viable. Okay, so there is a question here. We depend on adult learn to curl to attract new members. Will there be any su suggestions about how that can look? So yes, we are looking at Learn to Curl programs uh, as well. Um, a big consideration of that will be how to keep coaches um, and or volunteers delivering those programs um, to minimi minimize their risk as well as for the participants. So this will be a continued focus of what that will look like so we can map it out. Um, that way we can still deliver these programs and everyone can feel comfortable within the space doing that. Uh, question from Invermere, as we work through and digest BC guidelines, do we contact Kim Dennis at Curl BC with questions? Um, yes, you, um, and it's not just myself that has been working on this guideline. We have been doing it together as a team. So any questions that you do have, reach out to a staff member. We are collaborating together. Um, and we do have a, a compiled list of the ones that we've received so far, uh, just to make sure that we're checking as many boxes as we can. Okay, the next question, moving along. Do we know if bond spiels will be able to be held and what will this look like? Um, at this moment, I don't have a definitive answer for you um, until our guideline has been released. We are doing our best to align with the province and their restart phases. So bond spiels, um, may happen but they may look very different than what we are accustomed to and hopefully some of our working groups um, will look at the um, draft ideas that we've come up with staff and really be able to build on those and make sure that we have looked at um, all of the variations that are possible so that we can continue with them and we have a couple of minutes to go There's not as many well, questions coming as, as I was uh, expecting. Um, so again, um, once we establish these working groups, we will have, um, and working on these resources for you guys, we mil will um, have a way of being able to make them available to all of the members. So this is something that we hope um, everyone will be able to benefit from and again give some consistency um, across the province as well. 
um, a question here. Can you share what happened on the cocktails calls? So on our cocktails calls, we had our check-ins with our clubs, finding out the impacts um, to each club at the end of the season, as well as what the summer was looking like for them and um, some of the concerns for the fall. So it was uh, a big discussion to find out where everybody is within our province and um, some of the things that are more important at the top of the list for everyone as we move forward. So we are here, um, we are listening, and we do look forward to continuing to collaborate and really, you know, build our, our curling community from across the province. Yeah, our last question that we can be able to take is from the Naimo. <laughs> do we know if the number of participants allowed will be dependent on the size of the facility? So this question here um, has been the most ambiguous one, and I'm still working on receiving a definitive answer um, from some of the other sports sectors. So there are some varying um, answers to this question. For some facilities, it may depend on your ability and size um, to physical distance within it. Um, for some of our other clubs, you may be up to um, what your municipality has decided is okay. Um, and for some user groups, you may fall under the current um, order of mass gatherings of 50 people and under. So we, we are doing our best to see what we can do to leverage it. Um, you know, if we're able to have more people within one facility of how we can help our clubs in other areas. Uh, but we will have to be flexible and understanding that um, it may not be synchronized across the province and some of our clubs may have additional restrictions to work with um, initially but you know it's all it's all taking steps and phases so that we can return to curling and keep your clubs open and operating um, so I, I do hope that helps I am still looking for more more clarity around that answer as well so hopefully once I get an update I can share it with everyone uh, to help with your planning as to whether or not you are at the, looking at the size of your space or under that 50 person mass gathering. Thank you, Kim. And actually everyone on the operations team has been working very hard and long days on this matter. And I know you still have an awful lot of work ahead of you. And on behalf of everyone here at Curl BC, I'd like to thank all, I think it was 110 of you uh, to joining us today, today uh, are on our AGM and COVID-19 update. Um, just a reminder to the board members and the newly elected board members, immediately following this, we'll start our post-AGM meeting. Again, thank you, have a safe summer, and hopefully we'll be on the ice in the fall. Take care, goodbye.